Jay Shetty is a former monk and motivational speaker who's followed by over 20 million people worldwide. He went from being bullied as a child for being overweight and nerdy to living as a monk across India and Europe and becoming one of the internet's biggest celebrities. Need motivation? Watch a top 10 with Believe Nation. Top 10, top I got a top 10. 10 top got my motivation high for my top 10. Top 10. Gotta learn from the wise women and men. And men. All my life. Like na 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 For my top 10. Top 10. Top 10. Na 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 na. This one's for my top 10. Top 10. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael and I make these videos because you are probably the most ambitious person in your circle, but you know you're capable of more. And you get that push by surrounding yourself with the best. So today let's learn from one of the best, Jay Shetty and my take on his top 10 rules of success. Enjoy. Okay, let's kick it off with rule number one, focus on the present. If while you're writing your book, if while you're recording your podcast, if you're sitting there going, I hope this is gonna be number one, this better be number one. I hope I sell more copies I hope than I sell more copies than this person who's launching at the same time because that's the only way. Well, guess what? Now the quality of your output right now has just dropped. Mm. Because guess what? You're now living 75% in the future and you're 25% right now. And guess what? This 25% is gonna define that future goal and result. And your happiness. And your happiness. Whether you get the result or not. Totally. Whereas for me, when I was writing my book, and of course I want my book to be a best-selling book. Of course I want my podcast to do well. Of course, we don't do anything for it to be lost, like no yeah. one does that. But what I do know is that when I'm creating, when I'm producing, when I'm writing, that's all I'm doing. See, the truth is that only 2% of the world's population can multitask. Now the crazy thing is when- Who are those 2%? When 2%, when, when people hear that, they think oh, I'm in that, oh, I'm in that 2%. <laughs> like everyone thinks that, that they're in that. But most of us are the 98%. Yeah. And the truth is there is no such thing as multitasking. What it is, is fast switching between two tasks. So yes. the quality is just dropping. Because you can actually, you cannot do two things at one time. You cannot. No one genuinely can do two things at once. I guess you could maybe like pat your head and do this at the same yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you but, can't but, do something productive at the same time, right? Or creative. And yeah. so what I'm saying is that when you're sitting here going, this needs to be number one, you are reducing that thing's ability to be number one because it now yeah. doesn't have your full focus. Right. So, so that's the difference maker, that you can want to be number one, there's nothing wrong with that, but you can't keep comparing what number one is to someone else's goal too, because everyone's got a different trajectory. Like there are some people that are kind of come in and do really well at one thing and you're gonna do really well at another. And that's why competition has to first be in your space. Mm. Like don't compete in a space that's not yours. Right. Because now you're just trying to be someone else again and you get a lost identity. in identity. A exactly. Identity. Exactly. Rule number two, make your health a priority. I'd literally experimented with everything with my health, even as a monk, and I tried week-long fasts, and I'd pushed myself without sleep. I used to sleep like four to six hours a night, and I got to a point where I was like, I need to take care of my health. I, I need to make my health a priority, because I was so fascinated about mastering the mind that I almost neglected the needs of the body. And I can definitely say that I got to incredible places with my mind, but at the expense of sacrificing my caretaking of my body, and I felt I wanted to go back and do both of them together. Rule number three, experiment. A lot of my friends will say, Jay, you always look like you've got something exciting going on in life. And I'm like, yeah, I do. But that's because like nine people told me that my other ideas sucked, <laughs> right? And so like I've, I get more wins because I get more failures because I'm failing so often, I'm trying so many things out so often that don't go right. And then everyone sees the one thing that goes right. And that's how it works. And that's the odds for anyone. That's not just me. Anyone who's doing what they love every day is trying a hundred different things and most of them are not working. But because they're playing the game of numbers, something's gotta work. Like that's how I live. I'm just like, if I try 10 things this year, one of them's gotta work. But if I try one thing this year, most likely it probably won't work. Right. And that's the biggest challenge. If we just up our experiments, <laughs> it, like you gotta you know, do something new for every weekend this year. Rule number four, use positive competition. The way I see it is that competition in and of itself is not good or bad. And, and this is like the monk mindset on 99% on of things, that this mug is not good or bad. It could be filled with water or it could be filled with poison. Yes. And so competition, I'll give you an example. Yeah. As monks, our competition is in how much love and respect we show to each other. 
That's your competition? Like, that's what you compete on. Or so, how, how long can we meditate for? No, no, no. So, <laughs> I can so meditate longer than yeah. you. So if any monk is sitting, and I did this plenty of times. Really? If I sat there and I thought, oh yeah, look at him. He's scratching his back. He got uh, out. Like that, you, your meditation just got destroyed. <laughs> right? All the value. And so monks will never ask how long you meditate. They focus on how deep you meditate. And someone who meditates mm. deep doesn't go on about how deep it was. Right. But, but you compete for showing respect. You compete for serving each other. You compete for how well you can collaborate. Mm. And I feel like you live this. Yes. Like yes, I, I, yes. I feel like you have no, this. I in didn't your used to do that. Yeah. But the last but seven you years, now. Like, like you think like a monk. Like I feel like we're always trying to find a way where we can be better friends to each other support and each support other. each other. Yeah. And so you're competing on that, and and that's a positive competition that I think you can have. So you can still use. And this is the beautiful thing about the monk mindset. You can use any yeah. thing in a positive way. Hey everyone, I have been reading a bit from my friend's book, Evan Carmichael, Built to Serve, and I wanted to share this with you. So, according to a study by Carnegie Mellon University, people with supportive spouses are more likely to give themselves the chance to succeed. They studied 163 married couples and found that people with supportive spouses were more likely to take on potentially rewarding challenges. Those who accepted challenges experienced more personal growth, happiness, and psychological well-being. Now, I can truly say that I've experienced that in my life. When I first met my wife, I was just starting out. I had never released a video. I hadn't created any content. And she was such an important part of feeling supported on that journey. So whether you're in a relationship, whether you're dating, whether you're married, or even if you're single, being supported by friends and a strong community is important. Uh, Build to Serve by Ellen Carmichael, great book on how you can find your purpose and also on reminding us that we can all make a difference in the world. Thanks, Evan. Rule number five, redefine failure. Everyone you love and respect and look up to, that's been their path. And I think that's what's given me so much, that's what's liberated me from it. Like Steve Jobs is one of my biggest role models in, in certain areas of his life. And when I've read his, autobiogra- his biography sorry, by Walter Isaacson, it's like the guy has failed so many times, yet all of us, like most of us, have a phone that's an iPhone or an Apple product in our home or whatever it is. It's like he's not worried about all those times that went wrong because it, he obviously won big in, in this area of his life. So my take's just everyone you look up to, whether it's an athlete, an entrepreneur, a coach, a CEO, whatever it is, they have messed up so many times. And just know that. So when you're messing up, you're on the path. Like you're on the same path, right? And, and I, yeah, I encourage people to share what they're failing at too because it just helps. Rule number six, collaborate. Something that happens is you have to surround yourself by peers in a space too who understand you and don't see you as competition. And that's really hard and it's like a fine line. I genuinely believe that collaboration wins always. So I, my whole approach to most things has always been, hey, I wanna collaborate with you. Whether I'm bigger on social media or smaller on social media, I'm just like, I just wanna work together because I think that's gonna win long term for all of us. Both, not just in terms of success and numbers, but more in terms of, I wanna be friends with you. And so I reach out regularly to people that I admire in different ways. And I reach out to them and say, hey, I'd love to get to know you. I'd love to learn from you. I'd love to connect. I'd love to be a friend. Like, not I'd love to, for you to teach me how you do this. And if that comes naturally from that relationship, amazing. If it never evolves into that, I've just got a great friend who now gets me. So I try and make friends in two areas. One is in an area of people who understand my life because I feel the conversations you can have with someone who does exactly what you do are just so great because they already get you, right? And uh, someone that I had on my podcast lately, her name's Lily Singh, Superwoman. Uh, She's become a recent friend. She's been incredibly and is incredibly successful on social media. She's using her platform for doing amazing good in the world. And she was someone I reached out to because I was just like, hey, like you've been doing all of this for a while. You started on YouTube a lot longer than I did. And I would just love to connect from you and hear from you. And she's become an incredible friend. And we've just been sharing ideas and learning together. And it's like that relationship's awesome. And then at the same time, I'm trying to find people who are not in media. So I still have friendships with the monks back in India. And I just spent January in India for a month. I was meditating again for for roughly about 21 days. And I have them in my life because they remind me of like the roots and they remind me of the truths that bring me back. So I kind of like both. I love people who totally get my space. And usually those are people I reach out to. And then I love 
having my roots down. So most of my inner circle now is from people I've reached out to. Or they become people who've been reaching out to me for a long, long time and have been consistently reaching out to me asking for nothing. Rule number seven, spread the wisdom. I'd say I was quite rebellious and independent even as a monk. A lot of part of a monk's life is conforming and accepting authority and following a path. And those are all beautiful things for people who, who, who like those things. For me, it was a great training ground and a great system of giving me abilities and skills and habits that I didn't have before. But then I really felt a deep calling in my heart to want to share this in a specific way. So I, I kind of feel dragged to do what I do now because it's so deeply in me to want to make things relevant, non-sectarian, universal, and accepting of all truths and paths. It's just, it's just there and I can't ignore it. And I got to a point in my monk life where I just felt I, I can't ignore this desire to want to go and spread this wisdom and insight in a way, independently, in a way that I feel will work and help people, you know, from an impact point of view. And so that was a big part of it. Rule number eight, experience love. The challenge is that we think things come with emotions. Feelings. We think things come with feelings and emotions. And guess what they don't. So if you chase money. Well, they might for a moment, right? Or they won't. I don't think they even do. It's a false sense of feeling. It's such a false sense of feeling. I don't, uh -huh. maybe for a moment, but it's so short lived that it's, it's not even worth counting almost. Mm -hmm. So it's like when you, when you think that I'm chasing money, guess what? You will get money. Yep. And that's great. Money is really important. And money is a really important resource. But guess what? Money's not now gonna fill that gap, that void, that feeling, that emotion that you're missing in your life. What are and most so people missing? We're missing a deep sense of love. I think, I think the biggest need in the world, as we've heard many times before from all the ancient texts, they, they, they summarize it like this, to love and be loved. Like that is the need of humanity, to love and be loved. And when we don't experience that, we then start looking for status. We then start looking for money. Then we then start looking for recognition. To, to help us give the feeling of false sense of love. Correct. And the challenge is because most of us didn't experience that from our parents, and this is the key thing. What we crave in life is what we did or didn't get from our parents. Mm -hmm. What our parents did give us is what we continue to crave, or what they didn't give us is what we continue to crave. Mm -hmm. So you'll find that most people's love languages that they chase are things that their parents didn't give them. So if their parents didn't give them time, they now crave everyone's time. If their parents didn't give them gifts, gifts they crave gifts. If their parents didn't give them acts of service, they, they're craving those acts of service. So it's because of our childhood. And if we don't learn to process all of that experience, mm. which most people never get the time to do. And, and I empathize with that because I've had to go through that. I've seen me repeating my parents' patterns. Mm. I've what seen was the me, thing you were craving? So I would crave, a big thing for me was I would crave surprises and gifts because- That's your thing. Yeah, yeah. that's my thing. Still is your thing. It's still my thing. Yeah. And, and I- Did your parents not do that for you? No, or? they did. A, my mom did a lot of it. That's why so, you're still craving Correct. So my mom mm. would always, every year on my birthday, she'd always surprise me with the one thing I wanted. And I wasn't sport growing up, I didn't yeah, have a yeah. lot growing up, but she would get that one thing, whether it was like a Power Rangers toy, right. or whether it was, whatever it was, you yeah. know, something, you Video know. Video game Yeah, thing is you want as a kid, right? And she would always surprise me with that. And that became so deep rooted. Now I'll give you an example. When I then married my wife, you just expect people to know that. That they're gonna do the same thing. Totally. And so she now didn't you, do that. No, because I'm expecting my wife to be like my mom in the sense of I expected a surprise or show me love in the same way. Uh -huh. And she doesn't know that. She's not a mind reader. I can't explain, expect her to know that. So it took communication. It took yeah. time for me to explain that. So anyway, th I think that's where it stems from. That desire, it doesn't come from any, you can say it comes from society and education. Of course it does. But I think the deepest place it comes is what your parents did or didn't give you. Mm -hmm. That's that's where yeah, it comes from. Yeah. Rule number nine, get outside your bubble. I've seen some stories about some phenomenal Paralympians. I've seen some phenomenal stories about human beings who without arms and legs have achieved extraordinary feats. And this blows my mind because I always think like it's, some of us have challenges in different areas, but imagine being born without legs or arms or, you know, like actually not having stuff that we all take for granted. But those are like 
For some people, that would be an absolute dream to have that. Now through robotics and bionic limbs, they can have that. But for years, they've lived without it, but still seen, I've seen positivity in them. I've seen drive in them. I've seen a desire in them to achieve something phenomenal. So it's amazing what's happening out there. And we really have to connect with those stories rather than living in our small bubble. And often because we only live in our small bubble, we talk to the same people. Right, one of the biggest challenges with envy is that we talk to the same people and they talk to each other. So our group is so small that we only hear the same stuff and we kind of start living as if that bubble of life is real. And rule number 10, the last one before a very special bonus clip is focus on the long term. A young boy once asked his teacher, what's the difference between I like you and I love you? The teacher beautifully answered, well, it's like a flower. If you like a flower, you pluck it. But if you love a flower, you water it and nurture it daily and watch it grow. There is such a thin line between like and love. And because of it, we make so many mistakes in our relationships. When we want something in the moment, we take it and don't think any further. We do whatever we want to get that feeling of pleasure, not realizing that we're neither satisfied by that pleasure and nor will that thing last. When we pluck a flower, not only will that flower die, but we can't experience it for any longer than that moment. When you water it and take care of it daily, you can experience it forever. We've been wired towards an instant gratification, instant pleasure mindset. All of the adverts that we see, whether they're online or offline, are geared to driving us towards making instant decisions for instant promises of pleasure. The catch is, not only does that instant pleasure not satisfy us, the feeling doesn't last. We're so used to seeing all the strap lines and headlines on the internet. Learn this language in five minutes. Get the ideal body in 10 minutes a day. Become a millionaire in 12 months. Now all of these sound brilliant, right? The problem is, they're not real. They're not true. They're false promises. The reason why it works is because it appeals to one of the most basic human desires. Situational improvement without major resource investment. Of course you can pick up a few words in another language or shed a few pounds of weight if that was your goal. Or maybe you will make a little bit more money. But real knowledge real awareness, real fitness, real business. All of these things take time. Real relationships, real connection, real purpose takes time. Naturally, the internet headlines focus on the short term instead of the long term. Because most of us would never click on something if it said, learn a language in five years with dedicated daily practice. We wouldn't click on something that said, here is the one hour workout that you need to do every single day. And we wouldn't click on the one that said, if you want to be a millionaire, here are the 10 failures that you will go through in year one, how broke you might be by year three, and you may not even make it by year nine. The important lesson here is, if you want meaning, if you want purpose, if you want fulfillment, those things take time. Now I've got a really special bonus clip that I think you're gonna enjoy. But before that, it's time for the question of the day. I wanna know, what was your single biggest takeaway from this video? And write down in the comments below when you're going to take action on that takeaway this week. When you schedule in what day, what time, and what place you're gonna take action, you have a 91% chance of actually following through compared to just 35% if you just got motivated but never created a plan. And when you share your plan and have accountability, you give yourself an even higher chance of following through. So in the comments below, write down your single biggest takeaway as well as your specific plan of action, because I want to celebrate with you. Once there was a farmer who worked extremely hard. He worked diligently every single day to make sure he had the healthiest crops and the healthiest fields. As he worked, he often looked towards the opposite farm. That farm always seemed healthier, more lush and more green. He would often start to envy that farmer and feel some jealousy inside of himself. 
He would sometimes say to himself, maybe they have better land, maybe they get more rain, maybe it's because that farmer has more money from his family or his parents. Sometimes he'd say to himself, it's because that farmer has better tools or better tractors to plow the land. Often he'd think, it's because he's got more help from his children than I do. Every day, every week, every month, every year, this farmer was feeling more and more envious, seeing the lush, green, healthy, abundant land on the other side. He'd constantly wonder and be trying to figure out why it was that that farmer had the greener land. Till one day he realized he couldn't stand it anymore and he was going to go and find out. He made a route with a plan to get to the other farm. He went through the woods, over the hills, through thorns, through bushes, through all of these challenges to get to that side, to get to that farm. And then he finally made it. But when he got there, he was completely shocked, completely confused. He thought to himself, maybe I'm lost. He felt like he was standing on his ground again. He felt like he'd gone around in a circle and ended up in exactly the same place. He thought this because when he looked across again to the other farm, it looked lush, green and healthy. And where he was standing seemed average and normal. But when he looked back over to the other side, he saw his children playing on the farm. He had made it to the other side. And that day, he learned an extremely important lesson. He realized after making it to the farm that he envied, that the grass always seems greener on the other side. But then he went one step further. He realized that the grass is not just greener on the other side, it's greener where you water it. And whoever looks for greener grass on the other side will never be able to recognize, notice, or appreciate the grass that was beneath their feet the whole entire time. If you want to change your life in 30 days for free, click the link below me. And if you want 10 more awesome rules from Jay Shetty, check out the video right there next to me. I think you'll enjoy them. Continue to believe and I'll see you there.